Lonely warriors step over the remains of their fallen brethren. Skeletons line the streets in such numbers that one can hardly see the ground underneath. The infected spew blood in every direction. Only the very strongest remain alive in the barren ruins of once thriving major city centers. Cries of OMFG, stop it, what is going on, and my jimmies are rustled, echo through the empty streets. Thousands upon thousands of innocent are guided towards the light of their main menu screens. Hi, I'm Ran Levy. For three seasons of Malicious Life podcast, I've taken you through some of the most significant computer hacks in history. The world's biggest company taken down, a presidential election compromised, a nuclear power plant gone haywire. There have been evil forces at play, and ultimately good ones. Criminals caught, and many more still on the loose today. The common thread, of course, is malware malicious software, or a computer program specifically written to cause damage. In today's episode, we're switching things up a bit. The subject of today's episode is a kind of malware, I suppose. It is technically a software that caused a sort of harm to many thousands of people around the world. It wasn't, however, meant to do what it did. Really, what I'm talking about is accidental malware, or in technical terms, a bug. But not just any bug. A computer bug whose legacy lives on today in the field of, you guessed it, epidemiology. The story you're about to hear has as much to do with Ebola and leprosy as it does to Windows and C++. We begin in a dungeon. Within the heart of Zul Gurub lies the powerful demon Hakar with the red face of a dragon and a curling snake's body. Its limbs feature stinging pointed tips, its wings fan out in bright blue. Hakar's heart is purple, protected by a black, exposed ribcage jutting out from its torso. Worst of all, Hakar is doned in a magisterial red jacket like the one Michael Jackson wore in the Thriller music video. Hakar is a character in the World of Warcraft video game. Warcraft is what you'd call an MMORPG, a massively multiplayer online role-playing game created by Blizzard Entertainment. We say massively multiplayer because when you log in, you join into a game world alongside millions of other players with whom you can interact in any number of ways, whether it be fighting alongside one another or just chatting. This is a quite central aspect to the game. While most of World of Warcraft's gameplay involves battling monsters like Hakkar and earning collectibles, such as weapons and armor, the social aspect to being part of a community with gamers all around the world is really what distinguishes it from other role-playing games. There are couples, quite a lot of couples even, who met in World of Warcraft, fell in love, and eventually even married. I guess you could say most of them are now battling their own little monsters. Anyway, the massively multiplayer component is also what caused Warcraft, almost a year after its release, to become a picture of death and destruction that would shape how people thought about video games more generally. Zul Gurub was a raid introduced to the game on September 13, 2005. A raid, for background, is where a group of players will band together to fight and complete an in-game mission. Missions like Zul Gurub often culminate in a boss battle, where players climax their journey through a dungeon with a difficult fight against one particularly powerful foe. The boss of Zul Gurub was Hakar. Hakar wouldn't have been much to remark on if not for its most deadly power, corrupted blood. While attacking Hakkar, players had a chance of getting hit with corrupted blood, a virus that, once contracted, caused continuous damage through the battle and could only be cured once Hakkar was defeated. Any players infected with corrupted blood could also pass it on to other players through contact, like a real-life disease. It was a dangerous virus, dealing hundreds of hit points per second, but Zul Gurub 
was a high-level mission only reached by some of the game's most experienced and powerful players, those that could handle a few hundred hit points and walk away unscathed. Corrupted Blood was a way for the game's developers to spice up the Hakkar boss battle by forcing players to adjust the battle strategies on the fly. Really, for a player of the necessary skill level to reach Zul Grub, the effect wouldn't be much stronger than a common cold to a healthy adult. But World of Warcraft's engineers overlooked a key aspect to their game, one which allowed for an otherwise innocuous gameplay mechanic to become a plague, ravaging thousands of unwitting players throughout the game world. Thomas Eric Duncan had just recently quit his job in September of 2014 when he hopped in a car to take a sick pregnant woman to the hospital. Four days later, he boarded a plane from his home country of Liberia to Dallas, Texas. Only five days thereafter, Duncan was diagnosed as the first case of Ebola recorded within the borders of the United States. Epidemiology is quite a unique discipline. It was part biology, medicine, statistics, geography, and maybe a little bit murder mystery. In studying how diseases spread, equally as important as the diseases themselves are patterns in human behavior, how people move around, and how social groups interact. No sickness is itself an epidemic. What makes an epidemic is when sick people come in contact with healthy people, then those people get sick and interact with other people, and so on. Trying to track this web is like trying to track a high school rumor. Stacy heard it from Jenna, who heard it from Grace, who heard it from Franny, who told like six people and somehow posted it online, but then deleted it, and who even cares at this point? I'm just tired now. Human populations form these complex systems, and in order to make sense of how a disease can move through a complex system, epidemiologists often turn to statistical modeling. With models, you can try your best to recreate how populations ebb and flow, but people are just not that easy to pin down with numbers, no matter how deep your equations go. If only researchers could infect a study group with some deadly disease, then observe them as they kill thousands of people around the world, all would be good. That was a joke, of course. I mean to emphasize how difficult it is to track epidemics, how there are no simple solutions to be found, and why some researchers have to get creative in order to learn new things. Creative like using a video game event to study diseases. This event was really uh, something that raised this to the radars of everyone. And I mean everyone. After we have uh, published our paper in epidemiology, it was like, Uh, went like fire. I mean, they were introduced in all of the major broadcasting in time, in uh, national TV in the U.S. It was, it was really something that gained a lot of attention. You're listening now to Professor Ran Balitzer, an expert on today's story. So my name is Ran Balitzer. I'm uh, a physician and an epidemiologist and a researcher. And I serve today as the chief innovation officer at Klalit, which is the largest healthcare system in Israel, and also the uh, director of the Klalit Research Institute. It turns out that corrupted blood was its own sort of epidemic, resulting from a single oversight on behalf of World of Warcraft's developers. What was that oversight? Well, it has something to do with Thomas Eric Duncan. What Blizzard's designers failed to account for was a particular mechanic second nature to any player's experience. Instant teleportation around the game world. Because Azeroth, the open world environment in which the game takes place, is so vast, with many different regions far too spaced out to walk or ride between, players regularly teleport between locations in order to avoid downtime. Sort of like, say, riding an airplane from Liberia to Texas. Instantaneous travel meant that a gameplay mechanic designed only for strong players could swiftly leak out into Azeroth's general population. 
players losing in battle could teleport out to safety and regroup. But remember, corrupted blood's effect only go away once Hakkar is defeated. This meant that by leaving the dungeon without completing the raid, players began to unwittingly infect nearby player characters with no relation to them or to Hakkar at all. However, it wasn't just players infecting other players. Often, it was their pets. In World of Warcraft, you can expect that your character will die a lot. Each time you come back to life with only minor penalties, like slightly damaged armor. However, it happens to be that if you traverse the lands of Azeroth with a trusty sidekick, for example, a dog, and that sidekick dies, the penalties to you are significantly more detrimental. This incentivizes players to dismiss their pets during particularly tough battles to return once the danger has passed. Like mosquitoes to malaria or pigs to swine flu, it's believed that corrupted blood turned into a truly global phenomena as pets were sent out from Zul Grub into towns and city centers. Unwitting passerby came into contact with the disease-carrying pets and the plague spread outward from there. Of course, this was only phase one. What you are hearing now is the consequences of corrupted blood. those splattering sounds, each one represents one player bleeding out hundreds of hit points. Those moans are the sounds of player characters dying off from the disease. These are the sounds you'll have heard throughout the game world during the days of the epidemic, as just about the whole game slowed to a standstill. Where pets may have been the early indicator of an epidemic to come, it was the humans, as you might expect, who ended up causing the most damage. Once Warcraft players caught on to what was going on, large groups of trolls took hold of the opportunity, purposefully infecting as many people as they could for the fun of it. Those strong enough to withstand corrupted blood, but malicious enough to want to see it spread, actively sought out Hakkar, contracted the infection, then immediately teleported to the most densely packed city centers in the game. Unaware players were trapped and many contracted the disease and died before realizing what was going on. Others reported being chased down by laughing trolls. Perhaps the most effective strategy used by the trolls was to infect non-player characters. Townspeople such as shop owners who cannot be killed but can be interacted with. These NPCs acted like indestructible traps. In all these ways, Warcraft trolls reenacted what you might expect from real-life terrorist activity, finding large groups of innocents and then unleashing as much harm as possible through any means available. Another subset of the World of Warcraft population tried their best to fight off the evildoers. Player characters with healing abilities acted as first responders, rushing to the aid of the infected, healing the wounded, and reviving the dead. Those from Blizzard's developers' community attempted to mitigate the problem on a governmental level by setting up designated quarantine zones where the uninfected could congregate to avoid the epicenters of the plague. Some welcomed the help, others remained suspicious. The rescue mission would come to be called the World of Warcraft Health Organization. Ultimately, the rescue efforts ended up backfiring. Healers couldn't cure the weak, only keeping them alive for long enough to continue infecting others. The quarantines went about as you'd expect. They looked like big red targets to the bioterrorists who infiltrated the makeshift camps and ruined them from the inside out. One study estimated that about 100 new players per hour were being infected in any given city or transportation hub during the outbreak, though the true figures were never released. Concerned community members took to the message board, frantically letting out their frustration and asking for answers. Misinformation spread quickly, pouring gasoline on the dumpster fire. 
At this point, every server reached by corrupted blood became functionally unplayable. If you're still unsure why Warcraft would ever end up on the radar of professional researchers, it's worth noting that epidemiologists for years now have been creating their own simulated worlds not so unlike an online game. Here's Professor Ran Balitzer. So in recent, actually in the last three decades, there's increasing attempts to use mathematical methods in order to predict the way um, plagues and, and infections spread in populations. Uh, the thought is that if we can properly s- simulate or model the way the disease will uh, uh, disseminate, we will be able to better understand the mechanisms that can control its spread and, and prevent it. Now, at the beginning, the main use was in, in what, what was um, in, uh, differential equations. And this was a fairly crude method trying to assess uh, uh, this dissemination pattern assuming there, there's a mathematical pattern in how this thing explodes, basically, in a, in a logarithmic scale. Uh, and you can actually model it and, and how if you can think about it as, as like there's a, a, a wildfire. Uh, and you can think of how at the beginning it spreads very intensively. And as time goes by, there's less and less trees left standing and, and the fire goes away. So this type of approach has been used in, in these types of differential equations or what is called SEER models. Uh, in the next phase, they've tried to do simulations, which means you take virtual characters um, and give them properties by which they move in, in space, and they can meet each other, or you, you think about as bouncing at each other. And whenever they bounce, there's a likelihood that it can be determined that they will infect one another or, or transmit the disease one to the other. And they would also have likelihood of dying and likelihood of being sick, and, and you can modify their behaviors accordingly. If you'll have enough of these virtual characters or agents, as they're sometimes called, because this, this thing is called agent-based modeling or simulation, those agents, um, if you create hundreds or thousands of these virtual agents and you put a disease in the population, you can actually see in the simulation how the disease propagates and when it is stopped and how many people get infected. So this is one very effective, although very um, computer resource-consuming approach to modern infectious diseases. Virtual worlds are in most ways modeled after our own. Whether it be tailor-made simulations from research facilities or even the ones with wizards and monsters and experience points. When word of corrupted blood extended past the gaming community, a few creative thinkers noted its potential as a case study for how humans react to crises. Other researchers, and in most cases the prudent supporters of the theory themselves, were quick to point out the many problems with trying to equate a game world to the real one. To summarize their argument, it's a game. If you die in Warcraft, you respawn with minor penalties to your character. Assuming you don't subscribe to the concept of reincarnation, if you die in real life, you don't respawn. It's hard to get around this discrepancy when trying to draw lessons from corrupted blood. Players demonstrated a number of behaviors in response to the outbreak that you wouldn't expect of them in a real life or death scenario, such as those who purposefully contracted the virus for the humor value in running around and passing it on to others. There's also a demographic problem here. Some researchers in the know noted that Warcraft does sport an unusually diverse user base as far as video games go. However, it's still safe to say that certain populations, like American teenage boys, are represented disproportionately relative to, say, Nigerian middle-aged women. As such, to extrapolate how humans react to a particular situation by using the Warcraft population as a test case is sort of like extrapolating how humans feel about Selena Gomez by visiting a cheerleading camp. The results will be somewhat skewed and incomplete. With that in mind, however, it's hard to ignore the parallels between corrupted blood and how real-world epidemics play out. It was a sickness that originated in a remote rural area, then migrated into urban areas through human and animal agents. It was passed on through close proximity. 
Some were immune to its effect. In this case, the NPCs, high-level players for whom the damage was neglectable, and healing-based characters. Quarantines were arranged, and major city centers were evacuated. Some used healing to help the sick, and others took advantage to create widespread destruction. Other players logged into the game to see what was going on, sort of like journalists do. And even if death in Warcraft is little more than a nuisance, the fact is most players do put care and effort into their characters and take whatever precaution they can to keep alive. So here we have a model of a disease, a known source and means of spreading, and an environment in which humans can interact with it. That's better than most of what you can do with just numbers and AI. The quarantine setup and takedown, for instance, couldn't reasonably have been predicted purely from a statistical standpoint. From a mathematical standpoint, the advantage of a video game setting is that you can have both dependent and independent variables at play. You can't predict how human controls characters will behave, and you can predict exactly how non-players characters will. Where you have a limited number of possible actions available to those human players, moving, teleporting, casting spells, fighting, chatting, there are an infinite number of combinations to how a player can make use of those actions. Because games offer a human touch, they offer an added element of realness that standard statistical models cannot. Basically, the most difficult thing um, in these simulations is to give each agent a mind of its own and to know how real people act in space and time, how they not only robotically move from one point to the other, but how they actually uh, change their behavior according to events that, that happen. And it is obvious to all of us that once a disease begins or, in, or, or, or contagion begins, people do not continue to act like before. So you have to take that into account. Now, the events in a simulated world, it, like, like in a multiplayer online game, is a perfect opportunity to see how people act when they are fearful, when they are trying to protect themselves, when they are trying to do even, you know, uh, um, very heroic things. You know, in that game, some people try to heal other people despite the, the risk of their own uh, health. Um, some people fled. Some people uh, uh, tried to, to stay away from concentration of virtual populations to not to get infected. So this is something that we can use the power of people playing those avatars or, or those virtual characters and the, the logic in their actions that really is difficult to simulate automatically. Corrupted blood isn't a malware story, even though it is, in a technical sense, a computer virus. And yet, it does recall some of the ways in which malware acts and how we respond to it. Really, you could imagine this same story with hackers behind it instead of Blizzard's developers, and it might not have gone all that differently. I think something that's happening today and is interesting is that because there are similarities between computer viruses and biological viruses, that some of the people involved in cybersecurity are starting or are continuing to learn from the way the human body protects itself from these Uh, biological threats, uh, trying to mimic those and create mechanisms um, in, in computers that would protect them against unknown threats the way our, our body does so successfully. As for the scientific side of the story, only small pockets of video game-based research have popped up in the years since 2005. EVE Online is a multiplayer game which hired its own professional economists to oversee its in-game economy. Second Life is perhaps gaming's most prominent crossover into the world of science. Like Warcraft, it's an online multiplayer experience based on its own virtual world, except unlike Warcraft, it's not totally a game. There are no objectives, no inherent conflicts to overcome in Second Life. It's more like a virtual sandbox where players are free to do whatever they please. As such, it provided fodder for researchers in the fields of education, sociology, and even healthcare. Ultimately, it's difficult to tell whether the corrupted blood bug had any lasting effect on real-world science or whether it was treated as a mere passing fact. 
So I asked Ron Balitzer whether we should take away any lasting lessons from it. The thing about models is that every model is wrong. Some are useful. So we're not saying that what you'll see in a virtual platform like this would be an exact simulation of what would happen in a real-life epidemic. But that being said, it is still useful to use such platforms to understand some characteristics of population, how they react and how um, uh, a disease will spread in a real-world setting. And I think it is a, a, an invaluable resource to test drive uh, both dissemination patterns and containment mechanisms. Uh, in various ways. So I think it could be a useful tool, uh, but it is not very easy to harness it uh, for scientific purposes. As for the game itself, after a few days with half the Warcraft community down, Blizzard did what they had to do to get their game back up and running. They shut down their servers, then rebooted them without the new code. This probably is the point where researchers went, well, great, we wish real life were that easy. That's it for this episode. I'd like to thank Dr. Ran Balitzer for being a guest in the episode. Visit our website, malicious.life, to read the full transcript of this episode and others, and follow us on Twitter at at malicious.life and at ranlevi, R-A-N-L-E-V-I. You can write to me your thoughts and ideas to ran at ranlevi.com. Malicious Life is produced by PI Media. Thanks again to Cyber Reason for underwriting the podcast. Learn more at cyberreason.com. Bye-bye.